Hello, uh, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today for this session on bridging the digital divide. Um, this is obviously a very timely session. The last 18 months has made it abundantly clear how much we've all come to rely on digital connectivity and digital infrastructure in our lives. And I think it's clear that that reliance, no matter what happens, sort of working practices is only going to increase. Uh, there's an obvious requirement for more people to be working from home. We're going to come to rely more and more on smart devices, the Internet of Things. And I think there's a, there's a real um, assumption on the part of British people that we're, we're always on and always accessible. So it's not just about fixed connectivity, it's also about mobile connectivity. And to be fair to the government, it's made some bold commitments about what it'd like to do both around gigabit uh, broadband infrastructure and indeed mobile connectivity. Um, but it's all well and good making big promises. The devil is in the detail and the real question is about how they're going to implement their ambitions in this regard. And there's clearly some very serious challenges. Um, and we're very lucky here to have a panel who understand those challenges all too well and indeed how they might be overcome. So I'm going to encourage and ask each of our panelists to just speak for a few, word, a few minutes at the beginning, make some introductory remarks, then we'll have a bit of a Q&A up here, and then I'll be coming in the second half of this session to you in the audience, and indeed to our virtual audience that I'm assured is watching from all around the globe, no doubt, thanks to their digital connectivity, and we'll be having Q&A in the second half of this. So please do think about your questions. Um, before I come to Matt and ask him to make some introductory remarks, just like to thank Speed Up Britain for their generous support for this panel. We couldn't have done it without them, and they're obviously doing a very important job trying to ensure that this country gets the infrastructure it needs and the connectivity it needs. Um, so thank you, Speed Up Britain, and thank you, Patricia, for your support. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Matt Warman, until very recently the Digital Infrastructure Minister, and I'm hoping his newfound freedom will allow him to feel like he has the opportunity to mm -hmm. speak freely and give the government both barrels uh, <laughs> and, at the very least, tell us um, perhaps some of the things he might have liked to have done if he had his way. Um, over to you, Matt. <laughs> All right, don't rub it in. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so, look, thank you. I, I, I genuinely will, 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 I'll do a, a couple of minutes, and, and then we can think about this as Q&A rather than me giving you the monologue. But I think the title of the panel is Bridging the Digital Divide, but Nick has talked entirely uh, so far uh, about infrastructure. And for me, it, it, infra it, infrastructure is where it starts, it's not, not where it ends. Um, what we have to do, I think, uh, is look at what are the things that can accelerate uh, first the uh, the rollout of that connectivity, both fixed and mobile, but also what can we do to accelerate the take up of that technology? Because there is no point in installing uh, whatever fantastic cable or 5G service uh, if it does not actually result in the uh, benefits in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, in terms of economic growth uh, as well. So uh, I think this is this. This is both about take up and about uh, actually getting the rollout done. Just to uh, talk about the Speed Up Britain angle of it a, a little bit, I suppose, um, what I would say is that the, the approach that I tried to take in the department was to say, we have to remove every single reasonable barrier that we possibly can. And that means having some pretty hard conversations with uh, landowners, I think, about saying uh, at the, there was a conscious decision taken uh, a number of years ago that the uh, value of having digital infrastructure on your land will not be uh, quite as inflated as it had previously been. We're still living with the ramifications of that policy decision and the approach to reforming uh, the, the implementation of it is now uh, going to, I think, focus uh, increasingly on how do you accelerate the rollout rather than how do you preserve uh, the income of people who have uh, other bits of infrastructure on their land often as well. That said, there is a line at which uh, it may not be a reasonable step to uh, take. So, for instance, uh, the, one of the industry's requests uh, earlier on was that in order to get to uh, a, in order to get to somewhere that you wanted to install some bit of kit, you would also have the right to cross a third party's uh, bit of land. I think the view in Parliament, uh, rightly, is that that opens a whole can of worms that becomes incredibly difficult. So there are some really technical issues 
issues around uh, the electronic communications code that uh, touch on much, much broader topics than simply how important is it that we roll out the infrastructure that everyone agrees that we need. But I would end simply by saying the one thing that there is absolute consensus on whether you are a landowner, whether you are uh, a, a consumer, whether you are a local councillor, is that the broadband upgrade, the wireless upgrade, is of absolutely critical national importance. And so there is, I think, uh, more uh, consensus on this issue than perhaps uh, we like to admit. And wonderful as uh, campaigns such as Speed Up Britain and others are, um, sometimes remembering that uh, we are all on the same side uh, in the vast majority of this debate is what will get us the infrastructure uh, that we all uh, want and we all deserve and may even mean that the government, Ofcom and others, manages to avoid ending up in court and further delaying that process. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Matt. Patricia, I'm interested in your views on whether or not we are all on the same side. Um, Patricia is, of course, the chair of Speed Up Britain, uh, our sponsors for this event, as a former Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, so hopefully knows how to crank the levers to get things done in government as well. Patricia. <laughs> well, I certainly know how difficult that can be. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. And thank you to, to CPS for organising this event and uh, inviting me along. It's certainly a... Uh, an interesting novelty, as well as a great pleasure for me to be here at a, a Conservative Party conference. But I do particularly want to thank Matt, uh, not just for what you've said this evening, Matt, but for being such a brilliant digital minister. It was a real pleasure for my colleagues and me working with you. I probably, we may not have agreed on absolutely everything, but I just think across the digital agenda, which is a very wide one, you did a great job, and I really hope your successor lives up to, to what you did and builds on those foundations. So Speed Up Britain, um, as you can see from the literature we've popped out, we're a campaign group created by Mobile UK and the three main mast infrastructure companies um, that run, basically all the stuff that's needed behind the scenes for the mobile phones on which all of us depend, mobile kit on which all of us depend. The digital divide, of course, has many aspects, and Matt is absolutely right to, to point to that and the need to do quite a lot more to ensure that people who might have access in theory at the moment can't actually use it in practice. But what concerns us specifically is the mobile networks. And we very much began with a commitment to 5G. And we completely share, as an industry, the government's aspiration to make the UK one of the world leaders in 5G. Because the, without going into the technicalities, the potential economic and social benefits of this new leap forward in mobile connectivity are quite extraordinary. And I really would commend the excellent report that CPS did on this um, last year, indicating that actually if we don't speed up the rollout of 5G, our country will be worse off to the tune of well over 20 billion pounds. But you can't actually put 5G on a mobile phone mast unless you have 4G there. So actually, our campaign is also about the shared rural network. And for those of us who live in a rural area, and I do myself up on the North Norfolk coast, we know how critical it is to have that connectivity and how disastrous when we don't. And let me say that one of my colleagues, and it's great to see so many colleagues from, um, from the, the campaign here today, one of my colleagues was saying that not many months ago, um, they were upgrading a mast, not simply to worry about 5G or even 4G, but actually to put in 3G for a community who'd only had really that clunky old 2G connectivity that most of us can't even uh, remember. So this campaign to get 
high-speed mobile connectivity to every part of the country is absolutely about, in a phrase that I wish I'd invented, leveling up. It is about leveling up. It is about spreading prosperity right across our country. And it is about the new jobs, the new businesses, the new sectors of the future economy. And as Matt has indicated, the electronic communications code that the government um, introduced and we strongly supported uh, four years ago was designed to speed up the, uh, the rollout and to pull through the investment that the private sector is making and is willing to make, but that is frankly unaffordable at the level of rents, completely uneconomic level of rents, that have built up over several years. If you recognize that, for instance, uh, an electricity mast, the land only gets about 150 pounds, matter of a few hundred pounds. For a mobile phone mast, taking up about the same amount of land, it's thousands of pounds. So bringing those rents down to a sensible, a fair but sensible level was absolutely part of the intention of the code. And unfortunately, what has happened is that instead of speeding things up, it's actually slown it down as, I'm afraid, some, a minority of landowners and their agents have gone to court, dragged things out, played the process, and generally, uh, if we carry on at this rate, it will be decades uh, before we get anything like the 4 and 5G rollout that we need, and that will be hugely damaging to our country, our economy, and families and businesses all around our country. So I'm going to stop there. But thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Patricia, and thank you for the plug for the CPS report. I ought to have done that myself. Uh, it's a very good report. You all ought to read it if you haven't already. Uh, it's available on our website. Um, I would like to come to Matthew Fell, Matthew's policy director at CBI, and uh, be particularly interested in your views on the impact on, on business, Matthew. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, uh, thanks, Nick, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, look, I thought I should uh, start off by, in a sense, sort of tackling the question of what is the digital divide and what do we mean by it? Uh, and as Patricia has already said, clearly there are many aspects to it. Uh, three that I was going to uh, have a crack at, really, I think. One is actually just the sort of impact on both individuals as consumers, but also as individual businesses. Uh, quite clear that, you know, without uh, proper access to it, both uh, the connectivity, but also the capability to use it, I think, is really, really important for them. Uh, the second bit I was going to pick out was probably around place. Uh, Patricia, again, as you said, this sort of idea and concept of levelling up is not going to happen if we've got the not spots around the country uh, that are really going to depend on it for economic prosperity in the future. And then the third aspect of digital divide I was going to hit on, actually, was around uh, the UK in an international context. So if we're not going to sort of make sure that we can really ride the wave of this with some of the high-growth industries of the future, that's going to be a big uh, handbrake on the UK's export capability and so on. So if those are the sort of three bits that we should maybe identify as part of the digital divide, uh, how should we go about tackling those? Uh, well, my first thought is actually... I think all of us, uh, both as individuals uh, and those of us in business, actually have got a bit of a, a duty on us to be uh, a bit more sort of savvy and demanding consumers uh, in all of this, frankly. Uh, uh, businesses, I think there's a huge story, particularly around SME adoption. And just because over the last 18 months we're all sort of on Zoom or Teams or something like that, we shouldn't assume we've cracked it. But actually, that's getting to base camp. So let's build on that momentum and get really, really savvy and the technology into many, many businesses right around the country and they know how to use it. But also as individuals, actually, uh, and Matt, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues, along with the sort of Federation of Small Business, which Ofcom and your department and so on, collaborated on this idea of a sort of gigatag report to really sort of stimulate and prick the interests of consumers about how we actually get better at using this stuff, just to see the art of the possible in the future and get excited about it. So we've done good, some good stuff there around labeling and make it easy to understand and so on. 
But again, I think that sort of gets us to base camp. And what we really need now is to kick on from there and get the whole country talking and excited about the possibilities of what's going on here. So, you know, could we do something really big and bold about uh, tackling left-behind seaside towns? You know, if we mm. sort of fibre the hell out of them, put in digital boot camps and tackle second and third generation yes. employment in those areas in attractive places to live by the coast, you could do something really exciting with that. What about, uh, you know, my hometown of Hull, uh, Kingston Communications, KCOM, uh, doing really quite interesting sort of feel the need tr speed trials at the moment so people can actually experience the difference, you know, should we be doing more of that kind of thing? What about, uh, you know, a sort of tomorrow's world content push where maybe if we got all the broadcasters doing sort of lossless audio, UHD TV, maybe do it a big uh, sporting event, something the whole nation talks about, again, Everyone can get really excited about that, for example. So that's how I would sort of build up a bit of momentum, get everyone talking about it, get consumers and businesses really excited by it. Uh, you'd expect uh, next thought in terms of what could be done about it. Uh, I probably wouldn't be doing my job as a CBI if I didn't have a few ideas for what government could do to help uh, as well. Uh, look, it feels to me uh, we've got opportunities coming up in the next few weeks with the Chancellor's budget. Uh, we've got a rather perverse situation going on at the moment around business rates where if companies in tech invest in this stuff, they then get penalised for higher taxation because they've sort of driven up the value of it. So we should sort of tackle those kind of anomalies, uh, continue to get the foot down on delivery of some of the hard-to-reach funding. That will sort the sort of uh, left-behind areas and the hardest-to-reach areas and so on. Uh, and as others have said, the electronic communication code, let's really make sure that's delivering as intended and not bogged down in the sort of court cases and the, uh, the delays and the appeals and all of that kind of thing. And then my final thought would be just back on this international piece. Uh, look, there's so many opportunities and so many uh, exciting uh, new technologies and companies being developed in the UK around AI. Uh, there's a huge opportunity in fintech, massively plays to the UK's strengths in both technology and financial services, for example. Let's really have a focus on creating the right uh, climate for export success for these kind of companies uh, and making sure that we can go not just from having brilliant sort of startups, but having really brilliant scale ups uh, in the UK around all of these areas. They'd be my recipes for success in tackling the digital divide. Brilliant. Thanks, Matthew. Lots of ideas and energy there, which uh, is very welcome. Um, our final panellist uh, is Callum Cook. Callum is a member of the LGA's Economy Board, to give it his shortest title. And he's also the leader of South Stephen Council, uh, which of course in Lincolnshire, I think it's fair to say, a fairly rural and remote part of the country. So you are on the front line of some of these challenges. Yeah, I think we're both Team Lincolnshire. Yeah. But uh, no, I think just adding on from some of the comments that have already been made, you know, we, we live in an increasing digital world and, you know, reliable connectivity is crucial to everything we do, irrespective of where you live and, and what you do. Uh, and particularly the last 18 months has certainly shown us that. And you know, the digital technology sector, particularly in, in Lincoln Trash, is a significant contributor to our economy locally. And uh, I think looking at digital infrastructure just in the same way that you look at roads, railways and buildings is absolutely is, is key for the future. And I think, you know, tackling that digital divide will be, will be vital to ensuring prosperity is felt across uh, every household. And in the LGA, obviously, we work quite closely with providers. And I think we can almost bridge the gap between business and uh, local communities. And that's really what we are doing. And, and I know locally as a council, we've put money into extending our infrastructure in our own district and also across the, the county as, as well. And interestingly, what Patricia was saying about uh, various areas having 2G, uh, I can drive from one side of my district to the other and go from 5G, 4G, nothing, <laughs> and then uh, switching it back on again. So I think there's a massive uh, levelling up uh, theme to do there, across our, particularly across our county as well. Um, and I think, you know, COVID's brought all of these disparities into to stark light. And uh, you know, we need to accelerate that societal shift to a more online and, and digital world. I think it's really important that we, we make sure that nobody's left behind in that. Uh, and, and for me, and on, obviously speaking on a local government uh, efforts, is that you know, councils have a key role to play uh, in delivering the super fast broadband program, but also to act as that central point between government, between business, and between our, our local residents. So for me, it's about you know, how we can join up that support so all residents and businesses can benefit. Thanks, Callum. Thank you. Um, great. Well, uh, a really wide-ranging, very interesting set of different comments and lots of different things to probe. And as I say, I'll be coming to the audience for questions in, in due course. Do please think about that. Um, but I'd like to start by 
just asking Matt to expand a little bit on um, some, of the, some of the challenges uh, that are faced by just sort of getting the government machinery cranking mm -hmm. into action. And I was, a long time ago, I was a special advisor in Tuan Culture Media Sport um, back in 2013-14. Sort of and a lot of the issues we're talking about here, electronic communications code, shared networks, mm. way leaves, I mean, they're all the same issues yeah. that we were talking about eight years ago. And clearly, I didn't sort them, and nor did my boss at the time. But we're sort of, it feels like we're just sort of going over the same old ground. Um, do you, do you recognise that? And do you think there's a way through? Or is that just the inevitability of the way policy, policy happens in this country? Uh, so so I, th I think, on the one hand, it's a fair criticism. Um, on the other, if you're rolling out anything, you are going to be talking about waylays. You're going to be talking yeah. about uh, so, some of these sort of hardy perennials. Um, my frustration, I think, is that what we're really doing now in, in the reform of the Electronic Communications Code is seeking to make uh, it work in the way that it was originally yes. intended mm. uh, rather than to rip it up and start again. So it's, it's a sort of slightly frustrating insertion of oil into the engine rather than saying we need a whole new vehicle. Mm. Um, and, and I think that is uh, not, not a process that anyone would have hoped to have needed to go through, but we are where we are. Um, I, I think, uh, likewise, on the gigabit rollout, one of the frustrations will be uh, that, for instance, the tendering process will take a very long time. We will go to, I mean, we are in the process of going to Cumbria, for instance, and saying, you're right at the front of the queue. Um, the first shovel in the ground will be in many months' time as a, as a result of this. And that's a, that those are legitimate, there are legitimate reasons why the timetable is as it is, but I don't personally believe that there isn't some opportunity to squeeze some of that at the very least as we get on to other contracts further down the line where we will have learnt from uh, those very first uh, things. So, so does the civil service grind frustratingly slowly? Uh, yes, of course. But I think at the same time, it is literally the job of ministers to be patient. It is the job of ministers to say, how do you work this faster? Um, and to a certain extent, it's the job of the civil service to say, well, don't, don't go mad because this is what happens if, we, if you run before you can walk. However, uh, I think there is sometimes a degree of inertia where we can do better. Mm. Thanks, Matt. I, Patricia also... probably knows more about this than I do, if I'm honest. <laughs> well, I will, I will come to Patricia. I'd like to just <laughs> um, ask, ask one other thing, which is about, you know, it's, it's obviously the responsibility of DTMS to drive this agenda forward, and it, it does it with, with full heart. Um, but the Treasury is hugely important in this, in this area. Um, committed a lot of money already, and without asking you to sort of prejudge or reveal anything about conversations you might have had in the context of CSR, how high up the Treasury's agenda would you say this particular commitment is around uh, gigabit and wider digital infrastructure? Is it, is it sort of top of the list for them? Do they really recognise the, the so, so, so I think, for instance, in, in, in the Chancellor's speech today, you saw two big announcements. Um, one of them was on AI. So, so, yes. so, so the importance of digital, the importance of this area, that, that Rishi personally absolutely gets it, that the, the Treasury absolutely gets it. On, on the rollout itself, the deal, the deal with the Treasury was always there is a £5 billion spending envelope, we will spend it as fast as we possibly can and you will let us spend it as fast mm -hmm. as we possibly can. Um, and, and that is something that they have signed up to. Uh, I, th I think the, f the fact that we then had to come out and say our, our estimation is that we will spend £1.2 within the first year was an honest assessment of how fast can we dig up the roads. Um, however... Uh, I do think uh, there is, if, if, I, if I was still doing the job, if I felt in my own mind that we could go faster, there is then a crunchy conversation to have with the Treasury around, OK, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, and, and I think that, is, uh, that, that would be a lovely problem for any minister to have. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Um, Matthew, you want to come in? Yeah, look, just on this point about how high is it up the sort of priorities and things like that, uh, a lot of the debate over the last week or so, including at this conference, is clearly around uh, wages and living standards uh, and so on. And I think it's really, really important to understand that actually uh, encouraging uh, investment that's going to drive productivity growth is really, really important to underpin sustainable wage rises. You know, because actually without all of that, all that happens is wages grow up. But then all of us, the sort of cost of living goes up as well, and you just get inflation in the system, so no one's any better off kind of thing. So as well as actually just the sort of delivery 
of the money from a fiscal point of view from the Chancellor of the Government in terms of the hard to reach areas and so on, I would say either just as important or arguably even more important is creating the right incentives for private sector businesses to invest in this space because it is quite evidently a massive game changer for productivity enhancements. And if we get all of that going in the economy, the wage rises that we all want to see towards that move to a higher growth, higher wage economy are going to be unlocked by this. So that, I think, is yeah. uh, a pretty compelling reason why it has to be high up the agenda. And comes back to your point about SME take of an adoption, and obviously with your new uh, chief exec there, Tony Danker, coming from Be The Business, really understands the need to get businesses... To totally. Uh, look, we've had this uh, issue in the UK for such a long time. We've got the most brilliant innovative companies on the one hand, but we've also, we know, got a long tail in terms of productivity, whether it be in terms of skills, on technology adoption and so on. And the more we can drive that forward, that is going to be the sort of transformative thing for the economy towards a higher growth, higher wage uh, UK that we all want to see. Yeah. Patricia, please do come in on this point. But I'm also thinking you, you talked about uh, the ambition we ought to have to be a leader in, in 5G. And I think we probably, all of us on the panel, have an ambition to be a leader in all elements of infrastructure <laughs> rollout and the performance which comes off the back of that. Can you also just give us a sort of honest appraisal of how you think the UK is doing in that regard at the moment? We're not doing well enough. Um, certainly on, on the 5G rollout and, and your report really you know, underlined that and underlined the cost of it. Um, having said that, and, and it comes back to a point actually that um, uh, Kellum was making at the beginning, Birmingham is one of the, it, it's almost certainly the best connected city and region in the country, but actually in Europe as well. It is a 5G leader. And the reason for that actually is that local government, the Metro Mayor and the councils, absolutely got this and realized that although they, they as public sector entities were going to forego some of these nice little uneconomic rents they'd been getting, the economic benefit that they would unlock that both Matt and Matthew have been talking about was way beyond anything, you know, in terms of the little bits of rent that they would be losing. And so they got behind it, they worked with the, the operators and the mast, you know, the infrastructure companies, Speed Up Britain members, to actually make this happen. And I think that's critical, and I think that kind of partnership on the ground, Matt, I know you get it, but I found it interesting as a minister mm. that often ministers and indeed officials, and this is not a DCMS point or a party point, think that if they pass a law, mm. then, right, done that, big tick, change is going to happen, or indeed change has happened. Well, actually, no. <laughs> Passing the law is relatively easy. It's that implementation on the ground. And I think in this case, I mean, I think it was really good, Matt, that you and DCMS officials absolutely saw the need to amend the code, even though it was only three, four years old. Very frustrating. And so you had the consultation, finished much earlier this year. That was actually done in good time. We are still waiting to hear uh, the response from the department and the government to the consultation. We hope that is really imminent because we were delighted to see in the Queen's speech a promise of legislation in this session. Um, so that's really good, but it, it now has to happen. Um, so keeping up that pressure, I think, is hugely important. And in the meantime, local councils and metro mayors can really, really make a difference here. Mm. Matt, would you like yeah, to just, just, just to come back on that, uh, so, so the WM 5G, West, West Midlands 5G project, um, funded by central government. I mean, yes. it's, 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 yes. it's, it's a very, it, and it was very much Birmingham's idea, it was very much Andy Street's vision for what he wanted uh, to implement. Uh, it has taught us a huge amount, and, and, and we were talking uh, about how do we sort of cut and paste what's happened in Birmingham and apply it in, in sort of slightly varied forms uh, across the UK. Um, 
the, the, the good thing is that we have learned a lot from doing it. The bad thing is that what Andy has really achieved is a real sea change in how everyone cooperates, how united everyone is behind understanding the benefits of 5G and doing it in a, in a really new way. That's, that's very hard to replicate, and it's certainly impossible to replicate overnight because you need to get yeah. the buy-in that has, that has developed in Birmingham. So, so it's good that we know what we can do. It's good that we know what, what works. Um, that doesn't mean that it is that easy to cut and paste. Um, just, just on uh, when will the government come out with uh, the response, uh, I, 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 it wouldn't be fair of me to give people dates because my successors may have changed the dates. Um, but I, I think uh, we are certainly alive to the urgency of this and Parliament is returning relatively soon from this date and hmm. maybe we could keep an eye on that. Uh, and I know you'll be helping with that and in the Lord's Ed Vasey, I should have said my predecessor as Chair of Speed Up Britain, it's very cross-party this. Thanks Patricia. Um, Callum, a few comments there on the sort of bottom-up nature of, of some of the implementation of this and perhaps if I could uh, ask you to sort of with your LGA hat on rather than South Stephen hat, just talk a little bit about what the LGA is trying to do in this area, whether lessons to be learned from Birmingham or indeed other places which are getting it right and what, what the role of local government is more generally. Well, I think for us, I mean, obviously Matthew made the point about you know, the economy and uh, if we really want to unlock the economies around the UK, then we need to get this rollout happening because you know, I think if anything for the last 18 months, you know, people are now working in a very different way. There's a lot of startups, a lot of small businesses working out of their homes in quite rural areas. So digital connectivity is absolutely uh, key and at the LGA, uh, you know, we work with all of the, the stakeholders involved. Uh, obviously, locally, I've got experience working, you know, across the county in terms of uh, putting our own money into it in order to speed up the process. Uh, I mean, interesting enough, what people were saying about uh, landowners getting way leaves. I mean, in our district, I think most of it's owned by about five families. So in some ways, it's great because you've got a small number of people to work with, but it can also be incredibly difficult in terms of unlocking uh, and getting them to understand sometimes the benefit of what we're trying to do. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start coming to the audience in a second. So if there are questions out there, if you could just uh, raise a hand. Uh, yes, please, James, first question down here. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and saying your organization, that'd be great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, it's Helen Milner. I'm uh, from Good Things Foundation. We're a digital inclusion charity. I mean, I'm glad the panel all acknowledged that bridging the digital divide isn't just about infrastructure. Um, there are 10 million adults in this country who lack um, the very basic foundation digital skills, and I think we need to do more about that. But my question is about affordability. We know there's 2 million households, many of whom who are not connected to the internet, and many of them say affordability is the issue. The pandemic exposed this. So my question is, who should subsidize everybody getting access to the internet? Should it be industry or should it be government? Oh, and is that aimed at anybody in particular? No. No. <laughs> right. um, Tricia, perhaps you can start us off. It's... Uh, Helena, it's a really important question, this, and I think there are many reasons why people don't have access to or, or don't feel confident in using um, various forms of digital connectivity. I chair the Integrated Health and Care System for Norfolk and Waveney, and what we're finding is most people love the fact that for a lot of things, they now get in touch with their GP through email and have an email or a quick telephone consultation. It's really efficient. But if you or your elderly mum have got dementia, then forget it. You know, you need a face-to-face -face conversation. And, and in fact, the elderly person probably needs their carer there with them. So in fact, one of the reasons for using digital connectivity because it's more efficient for a large number of patients is that you can free up time for those for whom it is never going to be suitable. Um, and yes, cost can be a barrier, although it's pretty rare these days. I know it happens, but even thinking about my old constituency in West Leicester, which was a, a very, very low-income, disadvantaged area, most people even then had mobile phones and increasingly smartphones. And that increasingly is the easiest way to access the internet. So 
I'm going to sound probably very conservative or new labor on this, but I must say I, I would always look first to a highly competitive market, which is what we have in mobile connectivity, to keep bringing prices down rather than starting at the subsidy end. I mean, there will probably be a need for some subsidies, and certainly, again, in the healthcare context, there are patients with multiple conditions on low income where it would make perfect sense, even for the NHS, to be giving them a simple piece of kit, getting them connected, and helping them learn how to use it because their health care would be so much better as a result. And actually, you'd probably be saving time of NHS staff as well. Thanks, Patricia. Kellum, can, can I ask you to comment a little bit from a, from a local perspective? Is there some need for subsidies, something you recognize within your I think, own patch? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we've been looking at is on new developments is actually working with some providers on doing a community Wi-Fi scheme and actually uh, seeing how that can also roll out across villages as well. And quite often, it's sponsored by businesses. So. Uh, we've got a three and a half thousand acre, uh, sorry, three and a half thousand property uh, development in Grantham, and we're looking at ways in which we can do a, a community scheme that actually benefits all of those residents. Now that's on a new build, um, but then also looking at our own existing housing stock. And I know the LGA are looking at how we can make people feel connected. Um, but I do agree with Patricia. You know, the, the costs are lower than what I think they have been. Um, but particularly from a, a local government perspective, we're looking to see how we can work with others to bring forward a, a subsidised scheme. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the floor? Um, just, just to come back to, to Helen's point, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I'm proud, proud of doing in, in the job was uh, introducing social tariffs um, for uh, broadband and introducing the, the continuation of some of the schemes that providers brought in during the pandemic about not cutting people off because they when they can't pay the bills and they get into yeah. financial difficulty because they realize that connectivity is so important. Um, and particularly if you are in financial hardship, it's, ta it's taking uh, away a tool that would let you get out of it rather than uh, anything else. So, so, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we were able to do that. We did it voluntarily in a way that has, I think, worked, but time will tell. Um, and we did it voluntarily by, while also saying to industry, look, if this doesn't work, you know there is a regulatory path that Ofcom could go down. Uh, that sort of Damocles hang, hangs, o hangs over them if it doesn't. Uh, and, and as I say, time will tell. But, but I do think, ultimately, we are one of the things that Ofcom has prioritized historically, but possibly even somewhat too much, is an incredibly competitive marketplace that has kept bills down. Um, I think that does therefore mean that there are lots of options for people, uh, and, and I think we can be quite optimistic about that. Um, you could reasonably ask the question, had they not prioritized that comp competitive marketplace, might we actually have better 5G or fixed uh, systems? But uh, we are where we are. <laughs> Great. Right. Um, any other questions? Please, please do. Put your hand up. Yeah, great. Um, we'll start with the ones down here, if that's okay. Uh, chap in the front row, and then we'll come to you, sir. Yeah, my, my name's Nathan. I'm just a young conservative from uh, Altrium. I was just wondering, recently we've had like a uh, Huawei, so do you think that national security concerns might slow down the rollout of 5G, and like, how do you think we should combat it? Yeah. Obviously, it's going to be a risk going forward. But Great, thank you. We'll come to you in a second on that, Matt, if that's okay. We'll take another question at the same time. Thank you. Hi, Mark Bartlett from Sonex. Um, I couldn't agree with more about the, the need to come together, and certainly that since 2017, I think that the relationships across, across this challenge have not, have not been great. So question to the panel, what would you want from industry to now, assuming that the reforms come, what, what, what would you like to see from industry, both sides, in terms of building a joint vision for delivering uh, speed, the, the connectivity that we all mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Matt, if you could just briefly comment on, on both those, and then I'll come to 
uh, yeah, I mean, uh, look, the, the, the answer on Huawei is yes. It, 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 removing Huawei from the, from the uh, 5G network will slow down 5G rollout, and it will cost industry uh, many hundreds of millions of pounds as well. And, and we were explicit when we took that decision, or rather the government was explicit when, 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 when that decision was taken, uh, that national security ultimately is, is the only thing that trumps uh, the, the economic necessity for rolling this stuff out as quickly as possible. Um, that said, we are working uh, with the industry to do it in a way that is manageable rather than the sort of nuclear option, which was, right, rip it all out now. Um, and that could, there was a risk that uh, that would have meant whole parts of the country having to effectively turn off the mobile network while they rebuilt bits of it. So, so there is a balance, but uh, yeah, we've been, we've been very clear that if we were just going, continuing to go down the route that we were going down, then things would be going faster. But I think there's no point in having something that's faster if it's not secure. So it, 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 in that sense, it's not a difficult decision. Um, and then what, what do we want from industry? Um, I, I, I know, um, compliant acquiescence? Um, no, <laughs> uh, I, 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 th I think uh, what, what we would like from industry is, uh, I, I think the challenge that we've got on the, on, the ro on the rollout as a whole is that there is a huge amount of uh, commercial rollout going on that is great for uh, the, for, for the country. It means that there is less government subsidy required for the hardest to reach areas. That, that is a good thing for the taxpayer. And the fact that industry is trying uh, to uh, compete uh, with each other to get that sort of, it's, it's a land grab, right? To get to the area that doesn't have the great con connectivity because if you're the person that gets there first, it's relatively unlikely that someone will overbuild you um, immediately. What we do need though is cooperation with government and with Ofcom so that we can as quickly as possible identify the areas that are not commercial and put those out to tender through the gigabit program so that no one is left behind. And there is an argument that says, well, look, just do this on a, a pure free market basis. Let the 50-odd uh, let the 50 -odd players ro uh, roll out their broadband as quickly as possible, uh, and therefore we will identify where the places that aren't getting it are, and in five years' time we can then go there and sort it all out. That's obviously not fair. That's ob there's obviously no social justice in that, and it's not in the national or the economic interest either. But what I think industry can do is work with government, work with uh, Ofcom to be as transparent about those plans as possible, obviously in a way that understands that we will respect the commercial confidentiality of it and, and, and all that. But if you look at the shared rural network, we were able to bring all the networks together and say, right, you all have your own commercial plans, but without treading on those toes, how can we extend the network? I think having a, a version of that relationship that allows us to get Project Gigabit going as fast as it possibly can is probably the single thing that industry can do that would make the most difference. But that said, I realize it is incredibly difficult. Patricia, please please do come in. And I'm also interested in, you know, is there more opportunity around the shared rural network? Should we not be thinking about more sharing of infrastructure more generally? I think, look, there's a huge amount now of sharing of infrastructure um, compared with, you know, when we were doing 3G when I was a minister and, and everyone had to build out their own. And, and in those days, the mobile phone operators competed on their basis, on the basis of, you know, my network's bigger than yours or better than yours and all of that. And that's no longer the case. So I think mass sharing is developing really effectively. I think industry is doing absolutely what society would want them to do by bearing half the investment costs of the shared rural network. I think that's great. Um, you know, clearly we, we need the law changed in order for the investment to come through at the speed at which it could uh, and should. And I think, I mean, Matthew's the expert on this, but I think there might be a challenge to wider industry to really get in there and just show the innovation that can come and the benefits. You know, 5G will enable the Internet of Things. It will enable almost real-time um, communication and analysis of staggering quantities of data. And in, in healthcare, for instance, you know, that has the potential to transform, um, for instance, the care of the growing number of people working age as well as older 
who've got multiple conditions, who live with those conditions 24 hours a day, but who see their doctors, you know, even with the best surgery in the world, they're going to be seeing their doctor two or three times a year. But actually, with some relatively simple kit at home, or that they're wearing, um, their symptoms can be monitored 24 by 7, and the appropriate GP, nurse, whoever it is, alerted if something goes wrong. You can do proactive, personalized, population health management, which is probably the best, well, is the best and probably the only way of closing the gap between the demand and the need for healthcare and the amount that any government can actually afford to invest in the NHS. So the more across all sectors we see that kind of thing happening, the better I think it'll be to just get ourselves into this virtuous circle of faster infrastructure, more innovation, better services, better care, better economy, higher wages. So it's over to Matt. Yeah, look, just a few thoughts on, on both of those points. Uh, on the sort of who are we question, I, I mean, look, uh, you'd expect uh, a sort of strong economic voice from the CBI and all of that. I think two thoughts on this, though. Uh, one is I, I always do just remind myself, actually, government alone is privy to the full picture on the sort of security issues. And I, I'm sort of reminded, actually, we should sort of trust that judgment sort of thing to reach the right balance and the right kind of issues. Uh, and my other thought on that is, look, probably more so than in many, many other areas, this whole issue around technology and data and so on, uh, trust and confidence amongst consumers is really, really important for success. So uh, I'd sort of have that in the mix too on those. Um, on the second thought about, you know, what do, we, what do you want from industry and so on? I mean, I'm just reminded actually, over the last team, 18 months during the COVID pandemic, I think we've seen brilliant collaboration going on between government and various parts of the private sector to do quite remarkable things. And business has stepped up to the plate in many, many different ways, whether it's sort of, I don't know, uh, gin manufacturers turning their hand to producing hand sanitizers through to developing vaccines at incredible speed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's that sort of spirit of collaboration, I think, that's going to be really, really key to success in this space too, actually, because you kind of want uh, government's role, essentially, is to create the right regulatory environment to maximize investment. And it's the private sector's job to get out there uh, with investment and, and sort of know-how uh, with the innovation and so on. That, for me, is the sort of ideal partnership. And Patricia, I really like your idea of creating this sort of virtuous circle. Uh, in a sense, because I think that is a long way towards maximizing just how far the market and the private sector will go in terms of its investment. If we're out there creating the products and the services that everybody wants, this is where you get the demand coming from. And people are talking about it, they're striving for it. And the more that is going on, the faster the investment is going to go and the further it's going to go into the harder reach areas and that should then minimise the role that government needs to do and come in and backfill behind. Thanks, Matthew. A um, couple more questions. Then there was uh, one inside here. Thank you. And then, is there one at the back? No? Okay. Thanks. Stand up because I'm quite small. Uh, my name's Donny Gavin. I used to serve in the digital and cyber branch of the Army. And um, one thing that came surprised me was the entry level digital skills wise um, into industry it was always uh, there was a deficit and until recently I hadn't quite figured out why um, so I work with an initiative in the southwest um, bridging employers and schools to promote cyber skills in shoes and um, the thing that struck me as really strange um, the IT teacher of today isn't too different to the IT teacher I grew up with which is sometimes a second discipline, you know, it's the maths teacher turned into an IT teacher. Um, Funding-wise, wasn't brilliant. Uh, you know, the amount of schools that had computer science or computer lab after school was fairly poor. Don't start me on the gender balance. Um, and the thing that strikes me as really strange, we still don't um, assess our schools by their performance in IT. Mm. Um, and the, the investment in there isn't kind of as channel as want to be. I understand it's called a super eight subject. It doesn't fall into it. And it seems to me a bit of a no-brainer that when we're talking about digital skills, 
and we're not investing them at school age level, why that would be strange. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, one of the uh, very interesting things is the, the relationship between different departments. And obviously, you know, DCMS can have all the ambition in the world, ultimately, whether it relies on Treasury, Department for Education, what we now call uh, Department for Leveling Up Housing Communities, in terms of getting fibre rolled out. But I'm sure, Matt, you will have had some of those conversations. Is that something you, you recognise? And is it being tackled, do you think? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the frustrations about being a being the department for digital was that almost everything we did actually involved going to other departments and pleading the digital case. And and, and DFE is not unsympathetic to this, but I, I think if I was uh, if if I'd had the authority over schools to implement the, the what what. I was being told by industry was the syllabus, was the curriculum, was the investment mm. that they wanted, then it would look different. Yeah. But ultimately, it's not, it's, it's, you can't have other departments given the responsibility to look after mm -hmm. a bit of the curriculum or, or, or a bit of the education system. It does have to be for DfE to uh, advocate for, uh, to, and consider that, sort of that in the round. Uh, so I suppose I end up thinking, what I'd, what I'd like to have been able to do is, is two things. One is maybe to shout louder with, with DFE, but the other is to find ways of getting the industry in front of DFE itself to, mm. for, uh, for, for DCMS to sort of be the convener and say, look, this is, it's not that what you're doing now is bad, it's this is how it could be better. And if you hear it directly from... SMEs from big business from all of that I think that would have carried perhaps even more weight with DFE than what we were doing. Thanks Matt. Kevin any observations on what that looks like on the ground in terms of your know, education skills local level within Stephen? Yeah we need I mean you know there's a massive skill shortage at the moment and across local government you know you look for a programming a data officer you cannot get them for love and money and it is a real issue and actually the levels of pay that we pay in local government is restricted so we are now going externally to uh, bring people in to do these bits of work and you know as we become more digitized and you know Patricia mentioned about the internet of things actually as a, as a council we've done a trial and the huge benefits that we could get through uh, internet of things uh, particularly with vulnerable residents and the savings that would lead to should anything happen in their home uh, but you know programming and coding I mean I'm a school governor and I know uh, some of the primary school kids have can do far more programming and coding than I can do um, so I think it is starting to become more mainstream now. Nick, if I just say, uh, I think one of the big challenges around the whole piece on digital skills is just pace of change. You know, if we're, actually there is a real danger that the curriculum is always going to be playing catch up because things are moving so fast that the moment you've got something into there, things have moved on. So, uh, Matt, I might even go a little bit further even than getting the, uh, the businesses in front of the DFE. And actually, I think it's a big role for uh, business stepping up in this. And actually, maybe we can get the businesses directly into the schools uh, in doing things in a little bit more real time rather than going by the departments kind of thing. I think that might be one way of tackling this point around pace and keeping things absolutely on the money. Uh, the, the other thought that was actually, uh, again, I think there's a big role for business in uh, tackling uh, some of the social inclusion, some of the disadvantaged communities around this. There's lots and lots of children who are completely turned off by the school system and it doesn't engage them. This is the kind of topic, and actually through the digital garages, digital boot camps, although it's a bit of a divisive term and things like that, you can actually tap into a lot of children yeah. uh, in a way that they've not felt uh, engaged by the education system in a mainstream sense, but this is a topic delivered in the right way that can really fire them up and enthuse them too. So there'd be a few thoughts in terms of where business can uh, lean into this in a really good way. Great, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, question at the back, please. Um, just picking up on the education point and continuing that theme, um, obviously during the pandemic, a lot of young people had to turn to remote learning and in parts of the country where the internet isn't up to scratch, that meant that they fell behind even yeah. further. These are often disadvantaged communities, um, rural areas and coastal towns um, in the first place. If that were to happen again, I mean, fingers crossed we don't find ourselves in this situation again, but you never know. Um, we can't really afford to wait a few years for the digital infrastructure to catch up. So how quickly could things be put in place um, to help those communities if, if government did everything that industry wanted and, um, and perhaps government could, could hear that and, and act as soon as possible just in case to help those children in the future? 
Yeah, and sort of allied to that, and I suppose it's a question for you, Matt, but sort of, you know, as you look back on what's happened over the last 18 months, we had time again, would there have been different things that might have been put in place to try and ameliorate some of those situations? And, or, or do you think you know, we, the situation was the situation, there was only so much that could actually happen in terms of education? Yeah, so, so I, th I think two, two things. I think actually the, the single most valuable thing uh, that we saw uh, over the course of the pandemic was that the internet held up, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. that there was this fear um, that, and uh, it, it, it turned out somewhat surprisingly to me, be my job to ensure it didn't happen, which wasn't what I was told when I took the job on. Uh, <laughs> but there was this fear that the internet would just collapse, is that you were, that we would suddenly be left with no ability to do homeschooling, to do any of that communication because it, the strain would just be so enormous. Um, and we did we did some things that, with hindsight, turned out to be unnecessary, like. Uh, dialing down the resolution of the iPlayer and Netflix and that sort of stuff so that there was a bit less strain on the network, um, which obviously we didn't talk about publicly at the time, but we, we've, talk, we've talked about since. Because um, we, we did have this vision that sort of we were going to we were going to tell everyone to stay at home and the only thing they couldn't do was watch TV because we'd made it short possible for them to work, um, which sounds very bleak. Um, so, uh, so 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 there were there were some things that that, that we definitely did right um, on 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 that. Um, I think. What DFE struggled to do was identify and then get out the kit to vulnerable uh, families and, and to schools that had disproportionate numbers of, vul of vulnerable children. Um, however, it, you, in, a, in a pandemic, you couldn't just go on Amazon and order a million laptops. Um, so, so, so I think uh, in DFE's defense, they, they, they had to do a pretty Herculean task of getting out both connectivity uh, and the devices that could then be connected um, to those families. One of the rather frightening statistics about that is that a, a huge proportion of those devices were never actually used. So the, the families that were identified as needing them uh, then uh, didn't actually get the, depending on your point of view, either didn't have the inclination or didn't get the support, and inevitably I think it will be a, a combination of factors, to actually make the most of them. And that tells you, I think, quite how severe the digital divide is in this country and how much we need to focus on it uh, right at the very uh, first stages of education. Thank you, Matt. And before I wrap up, uh, final thoughts from you, Patricia. Thank you very much, and very strongly agree, Matt, with your last point, because I think there's evidence from quite some years ago that simply handing a laptop to a family or a kid, even where there's you know, access paid for attached to it, you need to do an awful lot more than that mm. to actually enable them to do their homework and everything else on that. But I also just wanted to make a final point, um, which is really a plea to everybody who you know, supports and, and gets this case for change. Don't be seduced by some of the more um, superficially appealing arguments that you will hear from the, the small number of people, but they're there, who really want the code and the existing rents unchanged. And the argument is that, you know, here are these lovely community churches and community groups and rugby clubs and even cash-strapped local authorities, and the wicked industry is coming along and pushing their rents down, well, yes, because the rents are completely economically unsustainable and are damaging the investment. They're slowing it down. Um, and of course, we don't have mobile phone infrastructure being built in this country in order to support community groups and rugby clubs and the rest of it. Wonderful though they are, I support all my local community groups in my village. We have the Lottery Fund and Sports England and all kinds of other things for that. Let's just focus here on the huge benefit of getting the infrastructure, the mobile connectivity uh, and the rest of it that we need and uh, we can all go and support our local community groups, but let's not keep these, frankly, windfall rents that they've benefited from hugely for several years. That's been very nice for them, but there are better ways to support them in future and much better ways to grow their local economies as well as the economy of the whole country. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you to you all for attending today. It's been a really fascinating session. 
Um, and before you leave, I'd like to just encourage you to follow CPS and CAPEX on all forms of social media. There are promo bags at the back. More importantly, and interestingly, there are drinks at the back. Uh, we have our next session in half an hour. It's the director, Robert Colville, in conversation with the new Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss. So please do join us for that. Um, but I would just like to, once again, thank Speed Up Britain for their support for this and thank... Uh, all of the panellists, Keller, Matthew, Matt and Patricia for giving us their time and thoughts. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.